Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and welcome to another Library 2.0 mini conference, Mental Health and Wellness. We're so glad to be here today. We express our appreciation to our founding conference partner, San Jose State University School of Information. And we're going to take a second here now and turn some time over to Dr. Sandra Hirsch and Dr. Anthony Chow. Hi, everyone. I am Sandy Hirsch. I am the Associate Dean for Academics in the College of Professional and Global Education here at San Jose State University. And on behalf of the San Jose State University, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this Library 2.0 conference focused on mental health and wellness, library workers thriving in uncertain times. I am very excited about today's mini conference that will focus on efforts by libraries that promote mental health and wellness programs for staff and patrons. Uh, you know, this is an especially important topic. Today is very topical and timely given the persistent changes and, and uncertainties that we've all experienced, certainly from the global pandemic, but from many other issues that we're all grappling with. I want to especially thank our partner, Loida Garcia Vivo, International Library Consultant and past president of the American Library Association. Loida has an impressive track record of addressing workplace wellness issues, and we are so grateful to her for helping us put together this outstanding mini conference today, including organizing a really outstanding opening keynote session with a stellar set of speakers. So um, I'd like to um, uh, say that San Jose State University uh, School of Information is very proud to sponsor this important discussion. And I am looking forward to hearing the sessions and the panel discussion and looking forward to learning the latest developments related to mental health and wellness. And it is my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Anthony Chow, who is the director of the School of Information, to just say a few words of welcome as well. Thank you so much, Sandy. Welcome, everybody. Um, as Sandy said, we're proud to sponsor today's event. And it's also a reflection of our new commitment to health and wellness uh, as a strategic value of the SJSU iSchool. As the uh, field evolves to meet the new demands of our disrupted society, it's essential that leaders and organizations make this a priority for their staff. We must take care of ourselves as we help other people. We are the best versions of ourselves. We are happy and healthy. All slides and recordings of today will be made available to you uh, uh, two weeks uh, or so after today. And again, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for our wonderful panel and all of those that uh, chose to attend uh, today. So have an excellent time. And without further ado, I want to hand it over to uh, Loida Garcia Febo, who, uh, by the way, I'm proud to say is our new health and well wellness ambassador and consultant for the School of Information at San Jose State. Loida. Thank you. Um, and thank you, everyone, for um um, this um, invitation to collaborate and also for the uh, amazing opportunity to talk about wellness that is so timely and we need it. So thank you, um, Steve Hardegon, Dr. Chow, Dr. Hirsch, and um, big thank you to the speakers of the opening keynote panel. And they are Shantae Barnes Simpson, Associate Director at the Center for Educators and Schools at the New York Public Library, Georgia Coleman, Chief Operating Officer at Richland Library in South Carolina, Millie Gonzalez, Library Dean at Henry Whitmore Library at the Framingham State University, and Dujana Meshala, Assistant Director General of the National and University Library in Zagreb, Croatia. So we are very international today. For purposes of this event, I would like to share information about what is wellness. Many organizations and researchers say that wellness is the act of practicing healthy habits, habits on a daily basis to attain better physical and mental health outcomes so that instead of just surviving, you are thriving. To speak about wellness, we need to speak about health. The World Health Organization, the WHO, states that health is defined as being a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. 
Well-being then is a positive state experienced by individuals and societies. Like health, it is a resource for daily life and is determined by social, economic, and environmental conditions. Well-being encompasses quality of life and the ability of people and societies to contribute to the world with a sense of meaning and purpose. It is a major underlying driver of policy, a coherence across sectors, and encourages galvanized action. Advancing societal well-being helps create active, resilient, and sustainable communities at local, national, and global levels, enabling them to respond to current and emerging health threats such as COVID-19 and environmental disasters. Um, some foundational aspects of well-being included by the WHO are principles of human rights, social and environmental justice, equity, solidarity, gender and intergenerational equity, and peace. The Centers for Disease here in the USA agreed with researchers that well-being includes different areas like physical, economic, social, emotional, psychological well-being, life satisfaction, engaging activities and work, and development and activity. And finally, ALA in our camp, in our field, right? Uh, the ALA Allied Professional Association includes eight areas of wellness in the wellness resource page. Emotional, environmental, financial, intellectual, occupational, physical, spiritual, and social. And uh, with this information, with that said, I would like to first welcome Dijana Machala from the Croatian Library Association and with a video. And in this video, we're going to uh, briefly learn about some of the um, uh, emerging strategies they are using in Croatia at country level, which is very interesting for librarianship. And Steve is going to help us with that. The video then will be posted, the entire video, on the event website. Croatian Book Month, uh, which is annual national program successfully promoting books and reading for over 25 years, uh, opened on 2022 uh, under, the, under the slogan, Do Good to Yourself and, uh, and the World, Read. Uh, and uh, it was organized by Zagreb Public Library uh, and also National and University Library participated in uh, that program among over 240 participants. And we organized uh, a training uh, on how to uh, find the resources on well being and self help in electronic uh, academic databases. This training uh, was uh, held as a part of EU Erasmus Plus Citizen Science uh, project. Our public libraries also provide trainings on how to cope with stress. Here is some examples of our colleague uh, uh, doing um, participating in workshops on strategies for managing and resolving conflicts, providing uh, guidelines to managing stress and crisis intervention, or avoiding burnout at the work. Finally, uh, when we uh, organize our uh, 47th annual uh, Croatian Library Association conference last year in uh, Zadar. We put well-being uh, as one of the main topic of our uh, conference. So um, between digital transformation and green transition, um, uh, about uh, talking about library profession in a new context, uh, the special uh, place um, in our presentations uh, was uh, the topic for well-being of librarians. Our intention was to open up a discussion about well-being of librarians in Croatia, to share information and knowledge about best practices, to see what our colleagues are doing in uh, libraries, uh, to uh, to, to speak about uh, well-being and raising awareness on how well-being at work is crucial uh, for success. 
And our intention uh, is to build a community of practice. So we um, uh, was very proud to invite uh, our um, uh, keynote speaker on wellness, um, Lois, uh, Loida Garcia Fibo, to, to uh, share uh, her knowledge uh, with our community. And thank you again, uh, Loida, uh, to came to Zadar and to share your knowledge on uh, such uh, uh, such a uh, big topic as a wellness. So it is a long journey um, uh, in head of us, uh, but uh, we could uh, say now that we should treat well-being uh, as a pr priority with accountability mechanisms such as regular all surveys. Um, uh, well-being is essential for coping with cost and change and work environment, and it should uh, have place in professional discourse of librarians. Um, we realize that well-being it is a multidimensional and complex topic, and that requires multidisciplinary uh, approach. It should not be just really uh, relay uh, relegated to organizations or uh, human resource departments. A uh, library association could create knowledge around well-being in line to minimize a stigma uh, about talking about emotions. Uh, we, sh we should provide training opportunities for leaders, managers, and uh, librarians uh, on how to nav navigate emotions at work, uh, how to overcome difficult conversation, and how to create supportive uh, workplaces. And finally, uh, we all participate in building a culture of well-being. Thank you for your uh, attention. So I can't wait to see more uh, national library associations dedicating a big part of their conference to wellness and, and many more countries and cities uh, uh, with um, waving the wellness flag as uh, Croatia is doing. So I hope this is inspirational for everybody. Now let's let's get into the conversation with our esteemed guest speakers. And we're going to start um, asking, why do you think there is momentum to bring wellness to library workers? And I can call your name so you can go ahead. Let's say Millie. Thank you for inviting me. My name is uh, Millie Gonzalez from uh, Framingham State University and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, this is, I think, an extremely important question because I think that how can we do our jobs if we're not taking care of ourselves? And I think that, you know, and I can, you know, speaking with my colleagues, I think the issue was that some of uh, our concerns came to a head during, during COVID years, right? Um, it was an extremely stressful time for my staff. Morale was down. Um, you know, there were issues with trying to um, provide service to, to the campus community. And, and meanwhile, they're struggling with challenges at home. So, um, so, you know, this is something that it has been a long time coming, even though um, uh, issues relating to mental um, wellness has it has always been there, um, and I think it's about time that we're that we're paying attention to it. Shantae, thanks so much, Loida. Um, Millie is absolutely right. There's uh, a number of reasons why we are thinking and pushing for wellness. Number one is because we're not all right, you know. Uh, like Millie pointed out, we all experienced a, a worldwide pandemic that brought everything to just a sudden halt. And we just had to figure things out. I mean, I was pregnant at the time. I thought the world was coming to an end. But I mean, we were all in front of our computers, in front of the television, and we were witnessing um, injustices that was happening to people of color. And now libraries were dealing with the book banning and the continued push to restrict culturally responsive teaching and the erasure of stories by and about LGBTQ plus and people of color. So the, the profession is being pushed and questioned and folks aren't okay. 
Uh, we have staff at all levels who are feeling stressed in and outside of the library. So like Millie pointed out, we can't help our community when we aren't okay. Thank you, Shante. Um, Georgia. Yeah, Shante, just to piggyback on that too, we you know think a lot about um, serving our community and seeing these issues of wellness and mental health kind of coming up in the community. Um, and we really strive to hire staff that reflect um, the community that we serve. And so they are our community. Um, so as we're trying to meet the needs of the people, um, you know, it's been a rough go of it a little bit for the last few years. And as we've been trying to to see how the library can and meet people, our customers in new ways on the front of mental health and wellness, um, I think it just makes sense that we want to do the same thing for our staff members. Yes, uh, Dejana. Thank you, thank you, Loida. Um, I just uh, um, hear you saying, uh, and I agree with you all, um, we uh, reflected the wellness at the Creation Library Association uh, to talk about the wellness on the uh, level of uh, library association, because we think that it's uh, uh, much easier to talk um, in a framework of uh, association than to speak about wellness and um, um, the need to, to be well as a person. So we just provided the framework for our uh, colleagues, for our librarians to, to go to association and to feel uh, free to speak about uh, their emotional status and how they feel uh, in such uh, uncertain times. Great forum, great opportunity. Um, and that's what we need to do. Um, and so how, this said, right, we're not okay. It is definitely, uh, there are even articles. I've seen two articles uh, in librarianship that says that we're not okay, and we do know that. Um, so how are your organizations supporting the wellness of library workers? And these can vary from organization to organization. Uh, we'll just, again, uh, we'll go with uh, Millie. So the, the question is, how are they? How are the organizations supporting the wellness of library workers? So, you know, one of the things that I discovered is that I need to get out of the way, right? I need to give my staff, uh, the agency, uh, and autonomy to decide what works for them. And so, um, so one of the things that I challenged my staff is, you know, I think it's extremely important that we focus and be intentional about um, morale. What can we do and not wait for others to try to come up with some magical solutions, but what can we do to control um, our situation and improve, you know, staff morale? And so, um, so a group of staff members volunteered and they created um, a committee called SMAC. Uh, staff, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> staff Morale Advisory Committee. And this is their committee. So um, it's a wonderful uh, committee because they are in tune with, with, with staff. Uh, so they, you know, we have an anonymous survey called, you know, Sweet and Salty, uh, where, <laughs> you know, we can, we can, you know, we, and again, I'm a bystander in this process. This is their committee. Um, and they're highlighting and bringing up issues that need to be discussed. The other things, you know, um, you know, and I always say, you know, if it's not working for you, tell me. But sometimes staff members are are afraid to have those frank conversations, right? And um, and so uh, so a committee like this, um, you know, and and they had their voice. So, for example, you know, out of this committee, they were like, these staff meetings are not for us, right? They're, you know, I don't like the format. You know, this is what I would like to do. And so, again, you know, for me, it's like I'd rather have a, a, an engaged staff than, um, than me create top down something that is just not working for them. So, you know, so again, SMAC did a wonderful job in, in, in polling, surveying the staff members. Um, they want to build community. 
Um, one of the things that you know we did before is that we hosted these uh, staff lunches. Well, they were kind of formal. And what they wanted is they wanted to build community informally. So again, this is something that um, it is their it is their it is in their hands. They have the autonomy and agency to create their environment. And for me, you know, there's a number of different things that I can do to support them. And those issues are bubbled up through SMAC. I love that acronym SMAC. Like, <laughs> let's smack all the things that's not serving us out of the way. Um, but libraries of all sectors are really focused on the wellness of staff. But I just really wanted to highlight a webinar from the uh, National Library of Medicine. And they offered a two week course called Wellness in the Library Workplace. And um, participants uh, was able to explore the aspects of a healthy workplace, including uh, physical, mental, and emotional components. And um, the first week, they looked at the evidence on the benefits of having a healthy working environment in the library, as well as in the community. And then um, you were able to discuss what does and does not make a healthy working environment and what's really uh, helpful about having that discussion is a lot of things that you are working with the dealing with that you don't even realize is unhealthy because it was just such a common practice, which is unfortunate. And then um, the second week, participants learned and explored changes they can make at an individual level to improve workplace health and wellness. And I love that because it included what you can do as the individual, but also what needed to be done in the different levels of the organization as well. So that's uh, one of my examples. Um, yes, Shante, and um, we, uh, ALA did that in partnership and collaboration with the National Library of Medicine and Bobby uh, Newman uh, taught that course. She's wonderful. I will mention her during my uh, closing keynote. Uh, Dejana. Thank you, uh, Lloyd. Uh, I think uh, Millie uh, just said this flexibility uh, in workplace. Uh, we, we as uh, uh, um, leaders or heads of departments must be uh, flexible with our co-workers um, because in the uh, time of crisis, uh, it is very important to have uh, staff or um, uh, uh, leadership to, to rely on, to, to have uh, uh, people uh, in front of you and to uh, uh, have uh, this opportunity to say uh, what is the best and how to achieve the best results uh, with the resources that we, we have uh, at the moment. So um, this emotional competence uh, is uh, perhaps uh, most uh, valued competence uh, than professional uh, skills at, at the moment of crisis. Thank you. I'm very interested in what Georgia has to share because um, Georgia's library was the recipient of the first uh, ALA citation for wellness in the workplace. And uh, that's something that uh, we established when, during my ALA presidency. Georgia. Um, yes, so we have a lot of Richland Library staff members, I think, in the audience, and so um, they will keep me honest. We do not have all the answers, um, and I think that's one of the first things that we've had to recognize is that this is very much a work in progress. I think a lot about our um, race equity work, um, our diversity, equity, and inclusion work that we've been doing, and seeing it from that lens, um, the importance really of first normalizing conversations about mental health, about wellness, um, within and among our staff has been really important to us. Um, and along with that goes authenticity and vulnerability and willingness to say, um, much like Millie said, you know, leadership doesn't have all the answers. Um, and so it has been wonderful to see our staff kind of jump in and also help kind of guide initiatives. We um, recently have ex expanded our employee assistance program. We heard that from staff that they needed more opportunity to connect with professionals, um, counselors. Um, and so that has been a, a huge benefit. 
Um, just on March 26th, we extended our FMLA benefits um, to cover 100% fully paid FMLA leave, as well as open PTO, which hopefully will allow people to get um, the time that they need to take care of themselves and invest that time in themselves. Um, and then even back, you know, Guido, you mentioned the award that we won. Some of that was about um, as we were designing our spaces, building in things like I've seen in the chat, like quiet spaces for staff to kind of decompress a little bit. I mean, can that really happen? Not so much, but we can try. Um, we have some quiet spaces for that, nursing mother's rooms, um, places, comfortable places for moms who are pumping to go and pump. So um, it's a lot of little like grains of sand on this like giant beach of things that need to be done, both in our organizations and in the broader world. Um, but together, I think we're we're kind of we're growing pearls. We're trying to. And one thing I would also add um, is that we have a telework op option, so staff members are able to work from home uh, one day a week during the academic year, and in the summer. Uh, two days a week, and that has been a huge morale booster. I think we can also learn from Silicon Valley. So like Google and LinkedIn, all of these organizations, they have that, um, that space for staff to just take time out. I was so jealous when I did the tour of Google. Like they have lunch and just snacks that staff doesn't have to come out their pocket and pay for like it just corners that you can sit and not have your whole day scheduled out for you so I think we could learn from other organizations granted libraries that they don't have the money like Silicon Valley but we could think of ways that we're in the library for seven or eight hours but does the all of those hours need to be scheduled do we need to be on the desk for two and a half hours, like things like that as well. Definitely. So um, you all bring so many, many different uh, components to this conversation. Thank you. Um, and then within that same line, how can libraries or workplace policies support wellness of library workers? Because um, these, are, these practices are great, but we do need, as we know, uh, policies and strategy. So how can these uh, policies support our wellness? Someone would like to start, maybe Millie or Georgia? Well, I can, you know, I can echo, you know, something that I mentioned before. And this is, again, you know, um, I defer to SMAC, right? And some of the things that they talked about were so or looking at policies and workflow issues that you know for whatever reason have not been you know sort of like that you know that elephant in the room that you know everybody knows about but nobody wants to tackle right and so that you know bringing issues to the forefront um, and focusing on policies and, and workflow issues, I think it's extremely um, important, especially if what if you know our goal um, is to you know to conduct the library through an equitable lens. So that you know um, it is you know it is uh, work that needs to be done, but it's not an overnight fix. It is something that you not have to keep on plugging away, plugging away, and then um, and it's always ongoing. Definitely, we cannot say we're bringing wellness and it's done. It's an ongoing work. So we do need that, to have that clear. Um, uh, Georgia, maybe now. Um, so I was thinking a little bit about this earlier and how ideally, you know, culture is supporting and driving policy and policy is also kind of driving culture and they're like in this positive feedback loop. Um, and so I think, you know, this, even this morning I had a doctor's appointment that ran late and I could text my boss and say, I'm going to be late. And she was like, girl, take care of what you need to take care of. And when I texted my team, they were like, you need to take care of you. We got you. We can start the meeting without you. And so that's not something you can write in a policy necessarily, but it is a culture you can reinforce through behavior over time. And then there are things that are policy, more policy driven, like are there, you know, or practice driven, um, more flexible work schedules and things like that. So it's just, this, I think it's just like any other um lens that we try to see the world through in libraries or any organization. It's this back and forth of 
culture and relationships driving systems and processes and hopefully the other way around too. Get started. I mean, we do need to get started, right? And then um, um, little by little, we can build on that. Shante? Um, totally, totally agree. Um, policies do uh, need to be revisited. And um, with things that's happening, if having staff uh, feel empowered uh, to to not to say that they feel unsafe in certain working conditions and being able to have just like the no questions asked policy when any library worker feels uncomfortable. It's like, I don't feel comfortable doing this and it should be left at that, being able to have something in place for that, uh, being able again to have uh, time off or vacations or just mental health days. Uh, without having to go to HR and having that used against you. Um, and then I would say lastly, being able to renegotiate some of your workloads and openly being able to express um, feelings of fatigue and burnout. Um, I'll use the example of the DEI work. Uh, I know many of us we we label it as the black tax because a lot of people, whether it's black staff or people of color, they're doing the extra DEI work with no extra compensation. So just like like uh, you said, Georgia, being able to have that culture for folks to feel comfortable going to uh, their manager or whoever they report to is saying, "I'm not okay. Um, I need to, I'm running a little late because of a doctor's appointment and not having that used against them if they have to have some kind of um, review done on them. Definitely. Shante, I would jump onto that and just say like a very small lesson that I learned through this is as we were going through so many crises in, in our country related to um, people of color being, you know, um, the police violence and then the shootings that happened. And it was like these back to back um, tragedies. Um, we wanted to give space and hold space for people to be able to have those discussions. But it was also really important for me to remember that part of self-care might be not having those discussions, too. So it's about it's about it's about holding space for it and also letting people opt in or opt out without judgment based on what is best for them in the moment. And that was just, I was really glad that I learned that like in the nick of time. Um, because, you know, I think, I think it, uh, sometimes our best intention strategies can also go awry if we're not thinking about how they work for individuals. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Area as well. Uh, Dujana, would you like to add something else? I just wanted to add uh, when we introduce uh, well being and wellness in library context uh, here in uh, Croatia, we realize that we do not uh, have enough information uh, what is wellness uh, in regard of, I don't know, uh, uh, public librarians or school librarians, academic librarians. Does it differ uh, among uh, type of libraries or it is something that is um, personal <laughs> uh, for for everyone? everyone. So uh, before thinking about um, in, employing some policy or uh, I don't know, um, proposing uh, the framework for the well-being and not to be too restrictive uh, for uh, all library community. Uh, our idea is to um, get um, to, to provide some, I don't know, job satisfaction surveys or, or to see uh, how the uh, librarians are uh, coping with workload. Uh, does it the same for, I don't know, every type of library? Uh, does it uh, the same for, I don't know, young, young colleagues and the old one, how they uh, differ uh, on the topic of well-being? So it has much, much uh, work has to be done um, to imply some um, general policy about well-being. I appreciate your view on this because this is an emerging area still. It's very emerging, uh, not only in cities in the United States, but in different countries in the world, because we need to think that for generations, we have just focused on work, on producing. And there are people that um, take pride in not taking days off and not taking sick days and then when they retire they have about 3,000 days because they have not taken them 
And um, I mean, do they live longer? I don't know. I don't want to get into that. But um, it's not a great practice. That's what we something we can agree. And then, so uh, the the points that Dujana makes are very interesting because different countries, different regions are trying to approach these. Everybody I see agrees. Wellness is great. How we approach it, how we how we bring this into this uh, work cultures that can vary from cities, uh, from regions, and countries. So it's very valuable, and we should keep all these um, aspects in mind. Um, we still have, oh, we are great on time. So we're probably going to cover many more questions. Um, now, uh, we would like to talk about how do you recommend library workers seek buy-in from supervisors and administrators? Like I said, this is still very emerging and there are uh, different uh, views and, and ways of thinking. Um, I, will, I will go to Millie. She is a current our our dean of libraries in the panel. You know, as I mentioned before, I think um, you know buying is essential. But you know, as I mentioned before, autonomy and agency. So, um, so I can come up with like the best strategies. I can look at the literature. I can, you know, uh, you know, research best practices. But if there's no buy-in you know, I'm never going to, I'm never going to proceed um, in, 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 in creating a culture of empathy and, you know, and supporting my staff. So, you know, so for me, I, you know, I listen to a variety of different ways. And I think, you know, similarly in, in all libraries where you have different, you set up different mechanisms to sit down with your, you know, your staff, whether it, whether it's a person as department, you know, as a group, um, we also set up something anonymous, uh, sweet and salty, where people who don't feel comfortable um, saying anything, they can say something anonymously. So I think it's extremely important to think about, you know, ways that um, it's, you know, for me personally to get out of the way and then take and then let others lead uh, uh, specific initiatives. Because sometimes, you know, I might have the same type of idea, but that other person um, will actually um, have uh, more more success. So, uh, so for me, buy-in is key, and there's just not one magic way of 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 getting it. Exactly, Shantae. Um. I just realized that we're talking to people around the world. Uh, so I don't know if this is going to resonate, but there's this show called Shark Tank. And it's pretty much people come on to pitch their business ideas. And so I would go to it with that same kind of idea. So uh, the people come on and they had this pitch. So I would say tailor your pitch to your organization's goal. Um, next, I would say frame the issue or issues at hand and clarifying how that can or will affect the goal or the mission of your library. Um, I would also say, check your emotions. I know that we're talking about uh, feelings and well-being, um, but not making it so personal. So like what you're bringing to the table is to support uh, the staff or a, a subgroup of staff. It is not just you representing yourself at the moment. Um, timing, I would say, is really, really key. So thinking about is your organization's uh, or your library's priority shifting because of things that's happening? Um, has a certain person left or joined uh, your institution? And is there... Um, is there a, a time for resources and additional time to support what you're bringing to the table? So it has a big project that your library just come to an end. That would be probably a great time to come with an idea. And then I would say, lastly, provide some suggestions so that it's not this um, big idea that didn't have any kind of like thought from your end or thought from additional staff and discussion, um, being able to provide uh, maybe experts on it or um, 
tools or just examples of other libraries, award-winning libraries or, or schools and showing how they're dealing with similar situations and how they're um, moving along with it. I just think that it's really um, important that we show whoever we're bringing the situation to how this is not like a situation that only your library, our, our library is dealing with, that this is something that's happening across um, the country or around the world, and that we should be able to think about how we could do the same work. Thank you. Um, anyone else would like to add something about this uh, buy-in question? So I'll share, and this is maybe like a little bit on the flip side of the coin, is um, something that I'm very passionate about and that has worked for me and my empowerment. It may not work for everyone else, so I fully appreciate that. Um, but I have struggled myself with um, treatment-resistant depression for about 20 years. And it is something that I am very open about um, as a leader in my library system, because um, when I tell a staff member that I recommend EAP to them, they know that it is because I too have used that service and there's no shame in that. Um, I have a position um, in the library where maybe I have a privilege to disclose in that way, um, but I'm I'm doing that. And so I would, I would encourage you if you are in a place where you feel safe or you are in a place where you can help normalize conversations and take away stigma, whether by talking about your own experiences or the experiences of um, people that you know and love people in your community. I think that um, really beginning to normalize those conversations, particularly around mental health, when we um, look around and say that some of the most talented, amazing folks um, in our library systems have a disability of one kind or another, um, mental health being one of those. Um, so I encourage you to, if, if you can do that, it can be a powerful way, especially if you're in a leader, leadership position to show that, um, that it's, you know, we're all in it. We're all trying to do this life thing the best we can. And um, hopefully we can help each other out a little bit with it. Thank you, um, Georgia. That's so important what you said. That there are many people uh, that um, the statistics says that um, um, one in four uh, Americans are experiencing some type of mental health situation. And, you know, at spectrum is, is wide and varied. Uh, Dejana, do you have something else to add to this uh, question? Uh, no, thank you. I just a uh, uh, wonderful uh, idea shared uh, by, by Georgia. Thank you, Georgia, for sharing this uh, experience with us. Uh, wonderful idea to to uh, uh, share. Thank you. I do have some more questions, but I see there are questions on the queue, and I would like to go to at least some of them. And um, one question, this is for the panelists, feel free to answer, you don't have to answer all of them, right? Um, how are library workers supposed to advocate for supportive policies when administration does not support them? I know we went over that, but if you have anything else to add in terms of policies, and I think this is a little bit on in the buying area. Um, if you have something else to add, how are library workers supposed to advocate for supportive policies when administration do, does not support them? Yeah, I totally understand that, especially if you're in a big system where um, where you are uh, going to work and you might not have that uh, that type of relationship that um, Georgia expressed, like that's ideal to have a supportive um, person that you report to, but um, in some um, institutions where like change really goes even above the person that you support, um, I think that there is um, layers and steps. And that's why I say, if you're able to tie it into what um, the organization or the library is already thinking about or whatever their the the goal or mission is, being able to align it, I think that that might be a helpful way. Um, the process and procedures that may look different because all of our libraries are set up differently, whether that is um, this work is being handled through HR or if this work is being handled through a union and that all looks different. So that's where the answer is not really clear cut. 
Anybody else on the panel would like to add something to that? I think that's um, always the hard thing with a lot of these issues is trying to change a system that isn't working from within the system that isn't working. Um, and so if you figure that out, <laughs> we could probably get a lot of things done. But I do wonder if there's um, a way to tie it back. Like, do you have a strategic plan? Are there customer experience goals that you have? Like what matters to um, that administration? What is motivating to them? Almost like turn it, turn it back. Like we as managers try to think about our staff. How are we motivating them? What do they care about? And how can we um, put this in, in their language um, in a way that makes um, sense to them? So um, yeah, that's what I would suggest. Thank and, you. And, and sometimes you have to find other champions, you know, that are outside of your scope and, and building those relationships. Uh, so for example, you know, sometimes um, volunteering at in, in, in getting outside of the library and partnering with different departments, then all of a sudden you build these relationships that are outside with out of outside of library walls. Um, and then you start cultivating um, a network of people. Uh, the more people that are involved and concerned, you know, the better um, better chances of any kind of movement. Um, and I also agree with what Georgia was saying. Sometimes you have to put things in people's languages for them to understand that it is a win-win situation. Um, and then finally, I would just add patience because sometimes something that is worthwhile, um, you just have to have patience and then you have to have dogged determination to change. Thank you. I, I'm going to go to another question that we have. Um, and this is very interesting. Um, it says that one of the fears in the discussion is that prioritizing self-care might lead to uh, uh, being perceived as, as being uh, lazy or passport people no longer needing to be accountable. And so do you have suggestions for how to advocate for self-care in a way that addresses these concerns or demonstrates that there can be a healthy balance? I can share, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, I was uh, really bur burnt out, had a number of different personal issues going on. And it was, you know, and then and then on top of that COVID, right? So it was a nice toxic mixture of a lot of different things. And, you know, um, I had to take a step back. And I think when I hear self-care, self-care is self-care to, you know, means, means different things to different people. Um, and, you know, and, and I realized, you know, I was overworking myself, working seven days a week, you know, um, emails at up to nine o'clock at night, and, and then I was never going to get done, right? So, you know, so I had to set priorities for myself, that what can I do to still be effective, um, you know, prioritize the things that needed to be done that are important to my staff, that are important to the administration, that are important to my students. Um, and then, you know, this other stuff is always going to be there, <laughs> you know, um, and that's okay. You know, I would rather be um, a happy, you know, hardworking person than someone that is overworked and miserable and resentful, right? So, you know, so you have to decide what, you know, what, how, what, what it means to you in terms of self-care. It could, might be, you know, pulling back. It doesn't mean that you're less, you know, any less of a of a hardworking um, employee. It just means that you're going to be doing things differently, doing things differently that you know that will help you actually be a better person. Indeed, indeed. And there's, I just saw a Meredith uh, uh, contributing compassion fatigue. Right, there are some terms that are being floated around librarianship and that are. Uh, do us good also to look into that and actually uh, share with others. In this case, like Millie uh, mentioned, um, it's not laziness. It's really taking care of ourselves. And, and hopefully uh, these type of concepts and um, are opening the understanding of everybody, upper management, middle management, and uh, the, even the part-time staff, because it's very important. Um, uh, anybody else has something to add to this? Um, yeah, I will just 
give a shout out to many of my colleagues that are part of the Black Caucus of the American Library Association, who really uh, allow me to learn that self-care includes saying no. I think a lot of times when you think of self-care, we think about, oh, we're going to a spa or getting our, our nails done or something like that. Self-care is just really being able to set boundaries and say no. And the fact that no is a complete sentence, there's no justification behind it is really important. So let's remember that when we're thinking about self-care as well. Exactly. All right. We don't have any comments, any other comments about that. We still have another question here and some time. And um, this one, it's it's a bit about, about why we had this cost, but um, how can we, and, and this is something that the person wrote, how can we as lower management better push back against organizational pressures around theme staffing and work to better support employees in taking advantage of their benefits. And we are all experiencing that in different settings, right? Uh, things staffing because we are experiencing uh, illnesses, caregiving, there are, there are valid reasons. So how um, people can uh, deal with it. Georgia, maybe you have suggestions. <laughs> Yes, I think, well, I don't, you know, um, I think it is important to remember, and we just came out of a hiring freeze, and we're still recovering from that. So there was a lot of thin staffing going on. Um, and that was an organizational problem, right? That wasn't like Millie's problem, or um, Shantae's problem. That doesn't mean that they individually needed to carry the burden of, um, of, you know, a thin staffing situation. Now, as a team, people came together and did that. Um, but I think as leaders and organizations, and um, we have to be kind and realistic about the expectations that we have for our staff and for our organizations and for each other. And that is something that we keep coming back to. Um, that's not something our, you know, director said, that's something one of our um, managers started saying, is this kind and realistic? Every time something would come up, is this kind and realistic? And that has really helped me gut check, um, you know, is this kind and realistic in the middle of a hiring freeze? Is this kind and realistic? Do we get it right every time? We do not. Um, but I think it's important to remember that they, those are those are organizational challenges that shouldn't translate into individuals um, dealing with massive burnout or not taking care of their um, their health needs. Thank you. Jenna, do you have anything to add? Maybe. Um, I, I just uh, want to, to say that uh, we should raise awareness about importance of well-being. Uh, this is something that is equally important as professional skills uh, to, to provide our uh, departments and our libraries to, to cope uh, with the demands of, of today's. So uh, when somebody has to, uh, I don't know, uh, take uh, three days or um, uh, to take uh, uh, rest from the work, it is beneficial to, to gain uh, that librarian uh, fresh back in the, in the office uh, for, I don't know, a few days. So uh, raising awareness about the importance of emotional competences uh, is uh, very, very important. Yes, definitely. Uh, there's another term that I've seen on the chat. It is about vocational awe, where everybody, you know, needs to uh, kind of step back, right? And so they can really look at how they can have a, a balance into uh, work in life. And um, these terms I'm mentioning very quick, they are more profound, but I encourage everybody to look into them. Uh, they are also very important to these conversations. Um, uh, we are running out of time, but I wanted to uh, ask a question that goes with our digital times, because we are living in this very connected uh, uh, um, uh, culture now, and, and it was very evident and even increased during uh, the pandemic. And so how can organizations leverage digital platforms to bring wellness to staff members? Anybody has uh, something to say about that? 
Um, I'll just jump in because I want to say something about that as a little something about the last question. Um, with the digital platform, I know that we have this, um, it's this virtual uh, platform. Please don't ask the name of it because I was also thinking about the name of the, the platform we use uh, in case like someone needs last minute uh, child care. Um, so there are uh, things that is being utilized to support staff. Um, we also just have to think that if we're a short staff, we can't continue to move as if we were fully staffed. So being able to uh, go up into a to administration and say, look, we would love to continue what we're doing, but the staffing is not allowing this. And so what do we need to pull until we have enough staffing to go back to regular programming or, or things like that? But life happens. So if your child's not in school and your babysitter is sick, there is a um a platform, there is a platform that we can go to that the I believe the library pays up to three of those sessions for free. So you're able to drop uh, the child off. I think it's called Brightspace, but I'll look it up and share. Uh, but also being able to use um, these customized virtual classes that could support Bright Horizons. Thank you, Brenda. Um, uh, also customize uh, virtual classes. So again, being able to have staff be able to do like yoga and meditation all with a professional when it's like suitable for them. So this is just some of the things that I could think of off the top of my head that can support staff at this time um, in this digital time. Thank you. Someone else. One of the things that, you know, it's also pertaining to um, the question before is that we just assume that the things that, that are being asked, you know, is what needs to be done and sometimes turning it around and and posing it at with a with a creative solution as a community saying well you know because sometimes administrators are like in a bubble right so you know so it's extremely important for them to understand you know what's actually really happening right and then uh, relating to the to the digital question it's like a double edged sword right you know, I, I got, I'm on too many Zoom meetings, you know, and, you know, that sense of community is, you know, is the sense of community is really hard to be, to rebuild, right? We have to do it in person. So turn off those screens, right? But then there are other opportunities that, you know, I would have never had because, you know, because um, like this opportunity of meeting so many wonderful people um, across, you know, across uh, United States and even, you know, even um, through Croatia. So, uh, so it is a double-edged sword, like how do we build community? And I think that that is really the answer is, you know, finding ways to make our lives easier, but not taking away what we need to, to do in, in order for us to, you know, to build community. We are running out of time, but I want to hear what Georgia and Dejana perhaps have to add. And so this will be, right, your closing also of many remarks as well, uh, Georgia. So I was just following a little bit in the chat, and I do think, um, and also what Millie and Shantae shared about, there there have to be trade-offs. Um, so we can't, we can't do all of the things with half of the people um, and start 10 new things and like become well all at the same time. <laughs> um, so we're going to have to prioritize. And I think if um, having those, if you can have a candid conversation, if you can present um, your, your um, solutions in ways that speak to hopefully the goals of the management that you're working with. Um, and if you can kind of join together and, and form, we've had some um, affinity groups start both um, organically and and uh, through our HR department. And I think those are good ways too to share, you know, people who are um, women in leadership are dealing with these challenges. So um, I think, you know, be allies um, and try to support each other where you can. And Dejana. Uh, 
but we should use digital technology uh, to help us overcome with everyday uh, problems and uh, tough situation. So be before COVID-19, we didn't think about uh, to, to, uh, to work uh, remotely from, from homes. Now we can uh, uh, took a day off or uh, uh, work from home uh, online. So digital technology uh, should help us to overcome and to feel uh, more uh, well-being than uh, without them they. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your time and your uh, openness to share with us. Um, we, there is not uh, one answer, someone said, right, uh, for that can really help everybody. Everybody has different uh, situations, but I do think that your uh, your wisdom, your knowledge and experience that shared today has helped folks. Um, it's very heartening to see how we went up to 812 attendees. Uh, it's incredible. Uh, we, we, we know, we knew there was interest in wellness, but um, uh, these really um, tell us that it's, it's a big need as well. And um, I hope this conversation was, was useful. Um, there are maybe some questions or some comments not addressed, but please, I encourage everyone to go into one of the other sessions we have. And perhaps that way you can find some answers. And um, great to have you all here, speakers and attendees as well. I would like to consult with Steve uh, if he has any instructions for everybody to go to their um, programs. No, we're going to close quickly, let you go into those rooms. We had 222 in the YouTube channel as well, so we were over 1,000. Congratulations, everyone. Thanks for a great session. We'll go ahead and close now. Thank you, everybody.